Well, welcome to um, our Tuesday afternoon Bible study. It's great to see you all here today. And if you're watching us online, it's uh, great to have you join in with us. Uh, we're continuing to work our way through Paul's letter to the Galatians. We're in the end of chapter 3. And I'm going to read from verse 26 of chapter 3. It's on page 1170 if you're using the Bibles in the room here. And I'm going to read from 326 to the end of the seventh verse of chapter 4. You are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as their heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Well, these are um, some quite amazing verses, actually. And I hope you're enjoying the series as we journey through the letter to the Galatians. And I'm not going to go through the context of the letter because you're, you're getting that most weeks. But just to remind any of you of the thread of argument that is going through this letter. Um, essentially it is this, that Gentiles, so non-Jews, are in. <laughs> We're in, okay? And you don't have to become Jewish to be a real Christian. Okay? So, that's the thread of the letter. That as Gentiles, which will be, I'm sure, um, the majority, if not all of us here, um, we're welcomed into the family of God. And there's no need, as Paul has already indicated on a number of occasions, and will do so with more... Um, vehemency as the letter goes on um, you don't have to adopt the Jewish customs and practices to be accepted by God now if you were here last week or listened online last week Dave covered verses 26 to 29 because that bit of scripture fits in with what came before but it also fits in with what comes after. And it's such a key part of this letter and a key part to the whole New Testament, really, that it's worth considering twice. Um, I'm not going to go over necessarily all the same things as Dave did last week, but we are going to look at these verses 26 to 29 for a few moments. When we get to verse 26 of this letter, Paul's whole letter, because if you remember, when Paul wrote this, he's just writing one long letter. We're the ones that have divided it up into chapters and verses. And if you were reading this letter when it first came, and you wouldn't have had a new paragraph, as you've got in the New International Version that says, Sons of God, 
then is, is kind of divided up from the bit before. If you were reading this letter for the first time, you'd realise that at this point, Paul has a dramatic shift of focus in this letter. Up to this point, he's been talking in what they call, and I'm not an English expert or English teacher, but he's been talking, as I've read, and I wouldn't have known this, or wouldn't have referred to it as, as this, but he's been talking in the first person plural. So he's using the word we. So we read um, that we have done this, we have done that. And he's talking of the experience of the Jewish people. He was, um, as we can read in, in different places, um, and I think this is in the letter to the Philippians, when he refers to himself as, as for his Jewishness, he was like the kingpin, you know, Pharisee. He knew the Jewish law probably inside out. And he refers to the fact that in the verses that we looked at last week, Dave said, verse 23, for instance, we were held prisoners by the law. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. He talks about the Jewish people being kind of the phrase he uses, that kind of locked up by this Mosaic law. Now, there's a change when we get to verse 26. Because he stops referring to we and then starts saying you. So he's addressing the Galatian Christians, Gentiles. And he says, you, all of you, you are all, if you read in these few verses, um, he's emphasising their privileged position as Gentiles and their relationship and their unity and union with Christ. So in verse 26, he says, you're all, depending on which version, you're all sons or children of God through faith. Verse 27, you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. He's lost the we talking of the Jewish people, he's now addressing these Gentile Galatian Christians as you. He goes on, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And we're going to get on to Abraham in a minute. You are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. Now, this shift in emphasis is basically the point in the letter where Paul is addressing the Galatian Christians and he is saying, as he would say to us, you are all really special. You're all really special and God has a plan in Christ for you. Let's look at a couple of these promises verse 26 you're all children of God through faith this is the message of the gospel that you can become a child of God and um, if you remember John's introduction to his gospel he um he begins it by saying in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was with God nothing was made that wasn't made through God and then he gets to a point in this wonderful like introduction to the gospel when he said that Christ came he dwelt among us and he says yet to all who did receive him to those who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God that's the promise of the gospel that to those of us who believe we have the right to become a child a son or a daughter of God and Paul makes it clear here how this happens he says you are all children of God through faith now the argument so far is has been against we referred to them um, a while ago and each person that's spoken here I've been to each of the sessions they've all carried on this theme which is great because it's what Paul wants us to understand 
that those that were trying to infiltrate the church, they're referred to as Judaizers, were trying to say, well, it's not just about faith. There's other things that you have to do. Now, in his context, it was, if you're a man, circumcision. You need to also, um, festivals, go to all the festivals. Um, what you eat is important. Paul is saying, it's not true. <laughs> it's about faith. Now on Sunday, I'm preaching here on Sunday morning, we're following the letter to the Philippians on Sunday morning. The letter to the Philippians and the letter to the Galatians are poles apart in what they're trying to say, but actually it's the same author. So there's a lot of things that kind of thread through both of them. On Sunday, when I preach from Philippians, I will be referring to Galatians. The bit that I have on... Um, Sunday um, says this in verse 2 of chapter 3 watch out for those dogs those men who do evil those mutilators of the flesh now, that's quite a warning now he's saying there watch out for those who try and say to you that to be a real Christian you must be circumcised that's the mutilators of the flesh that he's referring to here it's all quite grim isn't it um, so in his letter to the Philippians, which is a letter of pure encouragement, he's just saying, oh, just watch out for those. And those are the ones that he's really arguing about here to the Galatians. Now today, as we look at Galatians, I'll be referring a little bit to the Philippians. Now when Paul originally went to Philippi, which we read about in Acts chapter 16, um, a lot of you will know this story, you'll remember this. Paul is in jail with Silas. They're in jail because they've um, upset um, some slave traders um, in the marketplace in Philippi because they've cast a demon out of the slave girl. Um, that's caused uproar because it's taken the income away of these um, people who were abusing and misusing this slave girl. They end up in jail and the earthquake happens they can escape, they don't. The jailer is overwhelmed by the fact that they haven't escaped and he asks this question, what must I do to be saved? And Paul's answer is quite simply, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And this is the kind of argument that Paul's saying here. This, you become children of God through faith, belief in Christ. You don't have to do all these additional things that these Jewish believers are saying that you must do. And it's true for us now, I'm not going to go over old ground. Um, time and time again, week by week, people have been reminded here by the people leading this Bible study that it's about our faith in Christ that we find our salvation, not about the things that we do. Now the things that we do may be important and as a consequence of our faith and belief in Christ. So I'm not saying things that we do are not valid, but it doesn't earn your salvation. So Paul says, you are a child of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He then says, you have clothed yourself with Christ. This is a wonderful image. Dave last week reminded us of the story of the prodigal son. Do you remember? And he said about when the prodigal son came home and the father placed his best robe on him. And that's the kind of image that we get here when um, we're told about the fact that we have been clothed with Christ. Paul in one of his other letters to the Corinthians is 2 Corinthians 5.21. He talks about what is happening when Jesus went to the cross. And he said how God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. In effect, that's what's being said here. You've been clothed with Christ. When Christ died and gave his life for us, it was what Luther refers to as a divine exchange. Our sin was placed on Christ, and in return, Christ's righteousness was placed on us. It's an amazing exchange, because we win both times. Everything that's bad about us is placed on Christ, and Christ's righteousness is given to us. It's as if the Father places the best robe on us. And when, so when the Father looks on you, 
This is the truth of the gospel. We may not feel this or understand this all the time, but this is the truth of the gospel, that when the Father looks on you, he doesn't look on you as you look at yourself. He looks on you and he sees the righteousness of Christ, which is amazing, because we all know how, <laughs> how bad we are. Yet when our Father looks on us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Uh, the last you that I want to consider here, verse 29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now this is a verse that has caused much complication and argument and whatever. You, if you belong to Christ, are Abraham's seed. Back in the day when this was written, because of what these Judaizers were trying to teach, this would have lit the touch papers. And trust me on this, it still does now. If we backtrack to verse 16 of this uh, same chapter, chapter 3, Dave spoke of this last week, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Now remember the premise of this letter. This teaching was going on that God will only accept you if you become Jewish and therefore somehow you could inherit some of the pro promises that were made to Abraham and to his seed. Paul here says that argument is invalid because Abraham's seed that is referred to in the 12th chapter of Genesis is not talking about Abraham's Jewish ancestry. The seed being referred to in Genesis chapter 12, is the one who is to come, the Messiah, namely Christ. Now God loves the Jews. He did then, he still does now. But there was a misinterpretation of this promise given to Abraham. This is the heart of the whole letter whether you're a Jewish believer in Christ, whether you are a Gentile believer in Christ, is irrelevant. If you are in Christ, you are the heirs of the promise. Now, he uncovers this a little bit further, but basically saying, Abraham's seed, referred to in Genesis, is Jesus Christ. And the promises to Abraham's seed are yours if you accept Christ. So if you've heard the phrase chosen people, um, that's you. We're chosen. In Peter it says you are a royal priesthood, a chosen people. This is why Paul says there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. So this stuff about Abraham's seed is to kind of cover the Jew or Gentile debate. Paul then moves on to the slave versus free debate. Now the contrast, which was presented in chapter 3 earlier, um, which was covered last week, this contrast between imprisonment under the law and new relationships in Christ is now kind of clarified by Paul in an illustration which is drawn from kind of a household scene back in this day. Now this is a scene that's maybe not as familiar to us. 
But in the context that this letter is written, this illustration is drawn from a, a particular household where sons or children would have been treated as slaves until they received their full rights at the age of maturity. And there are three, these seven verses in chapter four, there are kind of three sections to it. First, Paul talks about the condition of slavery when sons were still minors. And he applies that to the human condition. Secondly, Paul talks about the sending of God's son into the world liberates slaves. And so somebody changes from a slave to a son or a daughter. And thirdly, the full rights of a son or a daughter is disclosed. So we're just going to look at these sections very briefly, one by one. So firstly, when sons were considered slaves. Now by saying sons, I, I could try and be all kind of um, inclusive and say it's sons and daughters. It's just easier to refer to what the Bible actually says here. It does say sons, but if you're a daughter, you're included. Okay. Um, but Paul gives us an illustration here of a young boy in, a, in a, what would be a wealthy home. The boy is the legal heir and future master of this entire estate. But as long as he is a child, his life is like that of a slave. And we get reference to guardians and trustees here. They supervise him, they discipline him, and they control him. Their orders regulate and restrain his behavior. And he's under their control until the time set by his father. At which point, the child will become free from the control of the father and enjoy full rights as heir and master of the family estate. Now, it's clear that Paul constructed this illustration that we read in those first couple of verses of chapter 4 to dramatize what life was like under the supervision of law. And he's using the father, as like the one who um, gives the law, and the child as a slave as being under that law. And as we will see next week, when I think it's Denise who is leading our study next week, um, in verses 8 to 10, we read about um, Paul's views of the Gentile Christian's attempt to observe the Mosaic law. He refers to it, so this is the Judaizers have infiltrated and saying to them, you must observe these Jewish laws. Paul refers to it, and he does a bit in the verses we're looking at, but it's uncovered a bit more in the bit that will be looked at next week. He refers to that as you being under weak and miserable principles. By their subjection to the Mosaic law, and the feeling that that is somehow where you will get God to accept you, he says you're just returning to your pre-conversion, slave-like condition. So when in verse 3 of chapter 4, Paul says, we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the law he's emphasizing this condition of slavery that the jews were in notice remember i said at the start we've gone from we to you he's gone back to we now and he's warning these galatian christians don't get caught up in the slavery that we he was referring to the Jewish people that we were caught in. And then we get this wonderful word that begins verse 4, but. It's a great word in scripture. Whenever you see the word but or therefore, you need to take notice of what's going to come next. So he says, having changed from you, so you Galatian Christians, 
You're in a special privileged position because God has accepted you and he's not requiring you to do the things that the law would say that you should do to accept God's favour. He's gone back to we, talking about these weak and basic principles of the world, subject to slavery. He then goes, verse 4, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son. This is where everything changes. God sent his son. This is the second section of this kind of little paragraph here. We start off with the condition that we were in because of slavery. Then everything changes when God sends his son to liberate us from being in slavery to having rights as a child. We get to verse 6. Because you are sons and daughters, God sent his spirit. So we get here a glimpse. You know, the word Trinity, which we may understand as God being Father, Son and Spirit, the word Trinity is never mentioned in Scripture. Um, but we see it very clearly here. God, the Father, sends his Son. Verse 4. The Father sends his Spirit. The Spirit calls out father and we are an heir which means we too can call out father through the life and death of christ our status is changed from slave to sons and daughters if we had the time to do it we could talk about the process of adoption. You're all adopted by Christ. And as somebody who is adopted by Christ, you have the full rights of a natural born child. I, haven't exp I didn't phrase that very well. But if somebody is adopted, is this the case now? If somebody is adopted and the process is gone through, and when at some points Things are signed, certificates are signed, an adoption certificate um, would be issued. Um, that child has the same right as a natural born child. And because Jesus came, Paul is saying whether you grew up in Judaism and then have accepted Christ, or whether or not, as to these Galatians, um, you haven't. Paul says, you all have the same right. And that right is to be known as a child of God. Verse 6, the we is gone and we're back to you. Paul says, because you are sons, God sent his spirit into our hearts and it's the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. This word Abba is an Arabic, Aramaic word. And it's the word that would be used for father by a child. Perhaps in a kind of an intimate conversation within the home. When Jesus um, spoke to his father, he would use the word Abba. Children would address their father as, as Abba. And when they did so, they were expressing affection, confidence, loyalty to their father. It's one of the most remarkable aspects of the life of Jesus. In that he addressed his father as Abba. And when his disciples said to him, Jesus, teach us to pray how you pray, if you remember, Jesus said to him, well, when you pray, say, Abba, Father. Now, when Jesus answered that question to the disciples, this would have been, if they had them, um, 
a kind of fall off your chair moment. The disciples wouldn't have been sat on a chair when they asked him that. Maybe they're on a rock. They would have fallen off that. Can you imagine? They're with, they're with Jesus. They would have seen the things that Jesus did. They would have known because it happened. It's, it's recorded throughout the Gospels that Jesus at times would have gone off to spend time with his father. He often would have gone to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane, places like that, on the hills of the Sea of Galilee. He would have gone to be with his father. And when the disciples see the intimacy that Jesus has with the father, and they say to him, when we pray, can you teach us to pray how you pray? And Jesus says, well, when you pray, you can um, address the father in the same way as I do. And you can imagine the disciples being there, really? Are you sure? And Paul here is saying to the church in Galatia, well, you can do the same. And he's saying through me to you, a couple of thousand years later, you can also do the same. That when you pray, you can say, Father. I hope we never kind of take that for granted. Um, and I'd like to encourage you that each time you say the Lord's Prayer or you begin your prayers, you just remember what a privilege it is to be able to say, Abba, Father, that you can address God our Father in the same way as Jesus addressed him and just in conclusion Paul says to the church at Galatia and to us here today not only are you a son or a daughter but you are also an heir you are an heir now somebody who is an heir has something come into them probably used this illustration before and my parents aren't here today but I hope I'm an heir <laughs> I've blown my pair of me. so that means that when oh, I've got to be careful what I'm saying though because they will watch this back um, but if I'm an in, if I'm due an inheritance from my parents um, then I will receive something that is theirs but I've got to wait for it when and that's how inheritance works. You, you kind of say, this is what will happen. This is where I want my money or whatever to go to. My estate will be divided up amongst whatever. But that is something that will happen in the future. Now, that's, that's true also of what it says here. But it's not the full truth. If you receive, if you um, read... The definition of the word that is um, written about in scripture that we translate as an inheritance, the definition reads um, something like this. An inheritance is a, is a secure possession which is ours now and can never be taken away. It's not something you have to wait for. So what Paul is saying here is you are no longer a slave, you are a child of God, and you have an inheritance. But this is not an inheritance we need to wait for. So we need to take hold of that and say, well, what I am in Christ is mine now. A secure possession which is yours now and can never be taken away. This is amazing, good news Paul to the Galatians you're a child of God and you're an heir to his promises and Paul to Central Hall Bible class in what month is it November 2022 you can address him as father Abba and his promises in your life are not something you have to wait for but they're yours now. And thanks be 
to God for that. Amen.